I am Olivia Fialho, and together with my colleague uh, Joris von Zungert, we'll be presenting the paper titled Reconceptualizing Processes in Transformative Reading. So one approach to foregrounding that extends original conceptions of the function of the term focuses on how reading experiences involve the self. And one approach that is particularly suitable to investigate these processes is qualitative research, both through think aloud and in-depth interviews. And in their groundbreaking work, Mylan and Koiken in 1999, they argue that responses to literary texts combine verbal, emotional, and cognitive elements that may account for the distinctiveness of the literary experience. In some of their studies, the researchers enlisted experiential accounts by inviting explicative reflection on foregrounding as reading experiences unfold. And by offering a hybrid of qualitative and quantitative procedures, they identified different forms of reading experiences. An overview of this work, Kaiken and colleagues they distinguished two forms of self-implication in literary reading, one function like simile, in that the mapping between readers' memories and aspects of the text hinges on a similarity between the two, and where explicit and symmetrical comparisons occur. For example, I am like a certain character. And another functioning like metaphor, in that readers metaphorically identify themselves with some aspects of the text, with a blurring of boundaries between self and other. Another might be the text, the narrator, or fictional other or real others in the world. So as a metaphor, the relation between reader and character during this mode of reading is asymmetrical. So reading as though I am a certain character has quite a different force than reading as though a certain character is me. Second form of engagement is a pivotal feature of what the researchers called expressive enactment. So trying to locate whether and how expressive enactment occurs during literary reading, Sikora and colleagues found that self-perceptual change occurs through a succession of evocative moments. And expressive enactment contrasted with five other modes of reading that you can see on the slide. So their findings primarily demonstrate that it is in the recurrence of affective themes, which can be conceived as a form of parallelism on the semantic and thematic level, in response to the deviations that a deepening modification in reader's sense of self occurs. There is a fundamental two-sidedness to most definitions of foregrounding. On the one hand, foregrounding is anchored in textual evidence, as a form of textual patterning, according to Simpson's definition, or a set of techniques, according to Douthwaite's uh, definition. And on the other hand, foregrounding is conceptualized as an experience, as a way to recover the sensation of life, according to Sklovsky, as a stimulus prompting affective uh, refamiliarization or recontextualization, that is a post-processing re-evaluation of the novel experience afforded by foregrounding itself. And uh, the term refamiliarization, recontextualization is a term that I used in 2007 paper, but my and Kaiken uh, term it reconceptualization, which today I find it more appropriate. So in my 2007 work, uh, what I found is that refamiliarizing or recontextualizing strategies involve the reader's transition across various mental and emotional states, such as uncertainty, anxiety, satisfaction, and joy. So as the reading unfolds, such states are identified based on the data incrementally elicited from the reader, with a particular focus on the content of verbal protocols, for example, I am lost, signals a state of anxiety. B, their prosodic features, for example, the tone, pace, number of pauses, and paralinguistic reactions, for example, smile, laughter. So in the transformative reading project, the aim is to further investigate how changes in the sense of self and others occur as the reading experience unfolds. So it focuses on experiential processes the same foregrounding as experience. And one of the questions it raises is how does literary narrative fiction deepen reader's sense, uh, sense of self and social perceptions? 
and what is the experience like, yeah, which is a phenomenological question. So during my PhD work in 2012, what I did is to invite readers to come to the lab and they, uh, and I offered them a text for them to read. It was a short story, Miss Brill by Catherine Mansfield. And I asked them to come and uh, choose five passages that were striking or evocative and think aloud, comment about any thoughts, feelings, sensations that occurred to them as they were reading those evocative passages. So then I designed, I devised a method called Lexical Basis for Numerically Aided Phenomenology, or LexNet, which builds from the work of Koiken and colleagues, uh, numerically aided phenomenology. And uh, the adaptation occurs at the level of unit of analysis. So it adds a linguistic analysis to it following a functional approach to language. So in a LexNap analysis, we observe what words and expressions are in repetition and the paradigmatic relationships among them. It's a way to assess, to access intersubjectivity. And you can see an example on the screen. So in devising LexNap, I focused on the temporal aspect of how reading experiences unfold. And results stemming from the data uh, indicated four types of reading experiences, and I argued that two of them were transformative, types three and four. So results uh, stemming from the data, they show that readers reveal their bodily spatial repositionings in relation to the text by the way they use bases, which helps them anchor meanings, even though this use might be pre-reflective. The notion that bases is central to the manifestation of embodied perception um, and the possibility to track deictic patterns through text has been widely discussed and, and demonstrated, for example, by the works of Peter Stockwell, Emmort, Swan, and Magliano, among others. And one of the categories that stood out was the use of perceptual deixes, including personal pronouns, as well as mental state verbs like thinking and believing. I argued that what I called modalities of the transformative reader including mental state verbs, imagining, and thinking, are realized by means of perceptual deixes and can be viewed as a form of located and participatory action. So the third type of reading experience, which I argue that is uh, also expressive in excellence, so again, I found the same form of experience previously articulated by Koiken and colleagues, and the fourth type, total enactment, they share a similar form of spatial reorientation to each other as compared to the two previous experiential type readers. Study that I conducted later, also a phenomenological interview, I asked 30 readers to come to the lab again, and I asked them to bring books uh, that have changed their lives or had a significant impact in their sense of self. Um, and I asked them to bring from three to five books and I interviewed them in two sessions. In the first sessions, I asked them to talk about each book and together we selected one that was the most impactful to them. In the second interview session, we talked in depth about that particular book and they were again asked to uh, select five striking or evocative passages and think aloud in relation to them. I also did differently this time was to adapt the interview schedule and I found inspiration in the work of uh, Claire Pizzamani. Uh, she's a French phenomenologist uh, in her explicitation interview and which uh, the objectives to gain access to how readers describe their subjective experience. Actually, the work of Claire is a uh, phenomenological interview. What I did was to adapt our interview schedule to reading experiences. Okay. So I used again LexNap as the method of analysis. And uh, what I did, one of the, uh, to match profiles eh, of study one and study two, first we applied the category system of study one, and then we formed new constituents. And this is an example again of how we capture intersubjectivity by looking at lexical repetition and modality. So what I did was to work with level two analysis. 
for the analysis that I will show you as follows. As a result, we arrived at a uh, transformative inventory, which is quite extensive, but it shows all of the kinds of constituents that we found. So for example, uh, when readers use vivid imagination of characters that are auditory, visual, tactile, or bodily responses, features, uh, that is detailed, also the sense of agency, for example, where is the agency? Is it in self? When readers say, I saw her as being younger, is the agency in both self and other, for example, and that's marked by the, inclus the use of inclusive view, for example, it kind of puts you in the eyes of the character, so there's a blurring of boundaries between self and other, or is agency placed in the other. In this example, the character was making a mental picture of the girl. He was imagining the girl. So as Maya and Kleiken indicated previously, transformative reading is indeed um, a content. It comes together with different types of cognition and emotion. And now you're able to discriminate and detail what kinds of cognition and emotions these are. And these are the, let's say, level three uh, categories. So they use imagery, they use identification, evaluations, etc. But as I said, for the kinds of statistical analysis that we conducted and that Yuris will present, we worked with level two constituents. Olivia gathered observations based on interviews with 31 participants and eventually handed me a CSV file that contained 209 observations related to transformational reading. The file contained some formatting errors and needed a few corrections to not result in data being counted, counted in very wrong ways. I also had to harmonize the use of data types and the way omitted or missing data was indicated, but all in all, it was a quite neat um, and neatly prepared CSV file. The data contained 13 columns with demographic information, which were not considered important for the current analysis, so I have ignored those. The data furthermore contained 40 variables reporting phenomena of transformational reading. For this analysis, I simply summed for each candidate the number of times a particular phenomenon, phenomenon was observed. Doing so logically results in a 31 by 40 matrix for 40 variables, in this case vertically, and 31 participants horizontally. Olivia's concrete question now was if this data might be clustered so as to see if there were distinctive groups within the participants. We can determine this in various ways. The first approach I took was using principal component analysis to reduce the 40 dimensions represented by the 40 variables to two dimensions so that we can plot all information in a 2D plane. Principal component analysis tries to figure out a reduced set of variables by combining variables so that those fewer variables explain all the variation in the data. In this case, the first two components, or new mixed variables, explain 55% of all the variance in this data set, and that's pretty decent. But reducing the 40 dimensions to 2 is especially useful because now we can plot all the data in a 2D plane. We can subsequently use k-means to figure out if there are indeed feasible clusters in this data. When we use k-means clustering, we just tell it the number of clusters we want. It then tries to group data points based on their shortest distance to that number of at first randomly chosen means. It then iterates this process choosing new values for each mean so that the total geometric distance between the groups of data points and their mean gets smaller. And after a number of iterations this process converges on means or centroids that do not change anymore. At that point, the data is grouped in the given number of clusters, whereby each group of data points occupies the least possible amount of area in the chart. In our case, we choose three as an initial number of groups, and this is just a guesstimate given 31 participants. And we see if we end up with something looking remotely sensible. 
and eyeballing this 2D scatter plot, we can see there might be uh, a somewhat denser cluster on the left and maybe uh, a somewhat looser cluster on the right. Some better means of reasoning how many reasonable clusters there are in our data, we can repeat the process of clustering with different given numbers of clusters. If we thus create k means clusterings of 2, then 3, 4, 5 groups, etc., we can plot in another, in another chart on the x-axis the number of given clusters for each run, and on the y-axis the so-called within cluster sum of square. You can intuit this measure as the total area a cluster occupies in the 2D cluster chart. The so-called elbow that we end up with tells us when adding more clusters has no significant effect on reducing those areas. This is taken to be a good indication of the number of actual clusters in the data, as adding more clusters doesn't really create more meaningful discriminatory clusters. This means that for our data we can conclude there are two clusters that might reasonably be distinguished. Here we color those orange and blue. Olivia's next question was if it was possible to calculate what, particip what participant could be regarded as archetypical for each group. One can discuss, of course, what archetypical should mean, but it looked reasonable to me that this would be the participant that would be closest to the mean of the cluster. And this is easily computed with basic geometry. Basic geometry gives us this geometric center of each cluster, the so-called centroid, which is depicted here as a cross. The participant with the closest Euclidean distance to that centroid can, be, can then be regarded as the most archetypical for the group. In this case, there are participant 17 for the larger cluster and participant 31 for the smaller, depicted with an open dot in the chart. There are more ways to cluster data, of course, so it is sensible to check if other methods yield the same result. And indeed, if we use a hierarchical clustering method to produce a dendrogram, uh, applying Ward's method, we end up with the identical two clusters. Maybe, however, this is not surprising at all, as it might well be that under the hood, the methods are mathematically actually pretty identical. Uh, but I'm no hardcore statistician on this level, so if anybody in the audience can tell me, I would be happy to hear. In any event, it seems reasonable to assume that we have two clusters or groups of participants in our data. And next, Olivia wondered if among those variables there are so-called constituents. That is, are there variables that, if you score on them or not, give us a clear signal that you belong to one group or another? For this, I first of all ignored a rather large set of variables depicted here that had no scores at all. Given that all participants all score zero on these variables, their power of discrimination is obviously zero. So we end up with 22 variables that have actual scores and that might be discriminating between the two clusters. Um, the clusters are indicated with a, no, uh, with a zero and a one in the top row. We apply some heat map coloring to this matrix, we get already a good indication of which variables might be constituents. The higher a score in a cell, the darker the color is. Notice how three of the four of the top variables seem to distinguish the smaller cluster on the left from the larger cluster on the right. Formally test this by applying a classic t-test for which the formula is given on the right, but this is pretty uninteresting. Turns out that there are five variables for which the mean of the participants in the first cluster is thus different from the mean of the participants' scores in the second one, that we are 95% sure that this is not due to chance. This is true for the variables with the green colored p-values in this table. Notice that these, for the most part, logically coincide with the darker colored variables in the heat map. But also, interestingly, there's one variable called SID passed in self FJ that is at the bottom of the heat map and which seems to be a bit of a binary indicator. That is, uh, if you show that phenomenon, you're in the smaller cluster, and if you do not, you are in the larger cluster. So, okay. okay so, as a, as a result, we can see, again, a replication of situation-centered self-transformation and tough love for the narrative, but now we are able to say a bit more about what kinds of identifications are involved. 
So for example, uh, here participants uh, and readers, they, are, they engage with mode of story imagery or with the setting itself. So, in the, and they make comparisons between or similes, they use similes of personal identification, um, making comparisons between situations in the story and in their own lives in the past. So, they use vivid imagery uh, and when verbalizing vivid imagery, uh, the agency is placed in the self, in the self or there is a merging of boundaries between self and others. So features here are visual. So readers, they refer specifically to quasi-sensory visual phenomena, either as a bare series of snapshot images or a more rich spectatorial perspective on character. So for example, you do see her in the end as quite sad. And they also refer to mind style, which means here readers imagine the worldview of characters which is constructed and experienced and reported in terms of their own cognitive perspective uh, or and feelings on the story world. And here it seems so although those characteristics they typify situation-centered transformative reading here, it seems like we find protagonist-centered self-transformation again. And some of the key characteristics are engagement through with characters as people. So there are identifications of or comparisons between the world of the text and the reader, but they are more present uh, resonance or present identifications. For, uh, make comparisons, explicit comparisons between the world of the text or characters and others. And there is also merging of boundaries between self and others. So they take the experience of the text as their own. And in imagining the world of characters, uh, features that are prominent are auditory features. So here, or they refer to tactile or bodily responses. So I've been moving towards uh, finding richer experience or richer descriptions of transformative reading and how changes in sense of self and others occur. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact myself or Yodis. And thank you for listening.